Tonight's theme was Spectre. Stories about ghosts or the supernatural and other things that just haunt. (laughs) Yeah. Some weird stuff. You guys have weird stuff. Um, What about you, Tori? Do you believe in ghosts? uh, I do. I... uh, Okay, I do. I think that there are ghosts, but recently I thought there was a ghost uh, in my kitchen. I was like, oh my God, it's my mom, you know, but uh, it was rats. So. Oh. oh, dear. Yeah, so. <laughs> no, they don't take a hint either. They're not very nice. <laughs> no, yeah. really not. They just started judging me about my clothing, just like my mother. Um, oh. It's terrible. Uh, <laughs> Moms. All right, we're going to get right into it because uh, you guys don't want to hear about us. Um, you ready or what? <laughs> Woo! Yeah, but make some noise like you're ready. Let's get excited. It's ghosts. Uh, It's going to be a good night. All right. The first storyteller is Lucy Frost. Lucy shares a story about things we leave behind and how some of them might be bulk items. Please put your hands together for Lucy Frost. Hello. One of the only things I knew about my next door neighbor is that she had tampons, lots and lots of tampons. I had only met her once briefly when I took the kids trick or treating. My youngest, Clark, went as Woody from Toy Story, but he had these long, beautiful, curly golden locks that I refused to cut because they were so cute. And so everyone kept thinking he was a cowgirl, and he was none too happy about that. When my neighbor, the one with the tampons, told him that he was beautiful, he said, we're never trick-or-treating here again, and and we didn't. Um, My neighbor, the one with the tampons, um, she had, I didn't know really anything about her other than that she had boxes and boxes of Super Plus Tampax tampons. And she didn't tell me that, of course. I only found out about that when I went to the estate sale after she died. And she was either, had always been a hermit, had recently become a hermit, I wasn't sure which. Um, all I knew is she never left her 50s ranch style house. And, of course, the boxes and boxes of tampons. So um, the I go into the estate sale, and in the bathroom, there's this open cabinet. And it is just full up with these boxes. And these are like the old type of tampons, where the applicator is about the size of a paper towel roll, say. <laughs> or toilet paper roll, whatever. Um, That means each of the boxes was about the size of a small toaster. So they really filled up the place, right? And I tried to focus on the rest of the sale. I mean, being a person who no longer needs tampons. (laughs) Um, But uh, it it was kind of distracting because I was curious about those, right? So I go into the living room and there's this couch and I'm like, oh, that's a lovely couch. And the next thing I thought was, wait, wasn't she menopausal? And then there was a bed in the bedroom, and I thought, is a double bed too small for our guest bedroom? And also, was she just trying to recapture her youth? (laughs) Um, There were quilts everywhere, $10, $15 quilts. And um, I should have been thinking about whether I wanted to buy the quilts, but instead I was like, of all things to hoard, why tampons, why? (laughs) Did she just have a very bleedy family member? (laughs) Or maybe, maybe, uh, she thought she was perimenopausal and that her period, like any old seventh grader, could just sneak up on her unannounced, (laughs) you know? So I told my then husband, I said, I'm just going to go into the bathroom. Would it be weird if I just went in there and checked the sell by date? So at least I'd know how old they were. And he was like, oh, yeah, that would be weird. (laughs) (laughs) And so I was like, well, do you think they're her daughters? Like maybe her daughter downsized from super plus to super and just threw her old back stock into the estate sale. And uh, my then husband was like, Uh uh-huh, 
And I'm like, uh huh, you agree that's what happened, or uh huh? And he was like, uh huh, why does it matter? So then I thought, well, I'll go ask the lady in the living room who is clearly in charge of this bargain market. Um, But the concern was like, what if she was the daughter? What would I say? I'm so, so sorry for your loss. And also, are those your enormous tampons? (laughs) So I told my husband, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to buy them, right? And then I'll take them home. I'll know what the sell-by date is. I'll know how old these boxes are. He's looking at me like I've lost my flipping brain. And he was like, but you don't need them anymore. And I was like, well, she didn't need them anymore either. (laughs) And... Um, so he said, so no, really, Lucy, you're going to buy hand-me-down tampons <laughs> so that you can take them home and check the sell-by date? And I was like, no, they're not hand-me-down, they're vag-me-down. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, he, uh, he was like, well, then, if you buy them, then when we have your estate sale... And I was like, oh, shit, he has a point, right? (laughs) Like, could I trust my kids not to put Tampax in the estate sale? I sure as hell couldn't trust my husband because he would have thought it was funny. Um, So um, I ended up, he shamed me into leaving the estate sale without ever buying the tampons or uncovering the mystery, but it did prompt a series of important discussions with my kids. So I talked to my oldest kids, uh, my oldest son, Thomas, and I'm like, whatever you do, don't put Tampax in my estate sale. (laughs) And he was like, what are you even talking about? (laughs) And I was like, well, not Tampax. Obviously, I don't have Tampax, but like, if there's a vibrator in there, so help me God, I will haunt you from the grave. (laughs) And he was like, oh, mom, can't you just get rid of it before then? I was like, I'm not saying there is one. (laughs) I'm just saying And then I talked to my daughter about my post-death expectations, and I told her, you know, when I die, just put in the obituary, just say what I die from so that people don't have to be all wondering. And she was like, Mom, nobody wonders but you. And I was like, oh, no, we all wonder. (laughs) Um, But whether we do or don't, just put it in there. And she said, what if you die of ass cancer? I'm like, just put cancer in there. Um... So I hadn't really thought about death and the after-death logistics before. I mean, I was so busy raising my kids and and working that I really hadn't put too much thought into it or any thought into it. So then I started thinking, what would I want in my estate sale were I to have one? Um, I mean, at some point. And I thought books. I mean, definitely I would want books in there, right? And um, the problem with having tampons is that it it just then everybody thinks about you that way so that you're like Lucy the bleeder when what I really we want to be known by is like Lucy the laugher or Lucy the authentic or even Lucy the smart ass right and also it's like you it, it's like if all they think about is these random items in your estate sale has your life had value and I, so I started thinking, what do I want in that estate sale? So I want books. I want art. But then when I kept thinking about what else I might want, it made me very sad to think about people picking over the carcass of my life. So then I thought, you know what? Tampax is the way to go. <laughs> she had it figured out because it's funny. It gets people wondering. It gets people telling stories about you. <laughs> But you know what would be even better? A box of dildos. (laughs) 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 Box of dildos. Uh, If it was a boy, he'd be like condoms. (laughs) Well, use them. You're like, yeah. Hey guys, uh, we if you have a seat next to you, uh, we would like you to you know let people know. Raise a hand. We got people coming in still. I need crowded. some seats. Uh, so if you can move over and you can do that, that'd be cool. We got some seats over here. Cool. Uh, looks like they found them. They don't need us anymore. Okay. <laughs> They've moved on. That was over. All right. <laughs> Easy. Uh, yeah. Give it up for tampons. That sounded great. Um, 
More of a diva cup girl, but whatever. Um, uh, I definitely don't have a box of anything awkward. In no, my no, no, no. Yeah. Really? No. Yeah. Paperless. Um, I okay. do not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you get it. Some of you will get it when you get home. Uh, I look forward to it. I just want you to be thinking of me and my period on the way oh, home. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Our next storyteller is Canella. Canella shares a story. Oh, yeah, she's got fans. Yeah. Uh, shares a story about a picture that was worth one perfectly good cell phone. All right. Give it up for Canella. Woo! After high school, I got really into cameras, so much so that I picked up extra shifts at my local Texas Roadhouse just to make the funds for a quality camera. At the time, I was really close to my aunt. I looked up to her as a mentor, and um, I took regard very highly. So when she asked me to go ghost hunting, I was really taken back. I took her seriously, though, but at the same time, I was like, well, this is a cool opportunity to check out my camera. And so she explains to me that there's a certain phenomena going on in a property that her family owns and that um, they pretty much, um, construction crews next to the home are reporting, um, the, they're pretty much reporting like a concern for the welfare of an elderly couple that lives there. And then she quickly tells me that the house has been abandoned for six years and that um, that elderly couple that they're describing are her grandparents and they've since deceased. And so she's very emotional and she kind of wants to get to the bottom of things, make sure that there's nothing menacing going on in the home, but as well, well, because she had um, elderly checking on the home. And second, if there's something extraordinary going on, why not fuck around and put it on the show Ghost Hunters? <laughs> and so the day of ghost hunting comes, and my aunt, um, my roommate gets wind that my aunt promised drinks afterwards. So we head to her house, and we're greeted by her nephew and her sister. We take the trip up to Rio Grande, which is about an hour and a half, and we pull up to the home, and I think to myself, like, how can this beautiful home be haunted? And so we get off, and I'm thinking, you know, Rio Grande, Coyote Alley. You don't even hear chinches. Like, it's silence. I thought that was strange, but we walked up the stairs, and we were greeted at the front, which is like a cement porch. Right before we go in, my aunt says that she wants to do a protection prayer. And my roommate holds my hand, and she's like, protection prayer? <laughs> and I grab hers back. Like, be respectful. And so <laughs> my aunt says her words, and, you know, we kind of just do this number right here. And I'm like, nah, vergas. Y'all want to ghost hunt? We're going to ghost hunt. So being young, you know, I open the door. And the first picture that I take is of the back window, which is a small home. And it's a kitchen window, and I take a click. And that kind of excites everybody to run in. And we're all kind of ghost hunting. 30, 40 minutes go on, and my aunt says it's time for a break. And so her sister and I were the only ones who had cameras. And not even 30 seconds goes by that we're examining our footage, and we're just staring at each other in a blank silence. And all of a sudden, like, me and her are passing the camera around because we can't even speak, and now everybody in the room is conscious that this innocent Casper-like, you know, experience quickly turned really evil. And so we're all experiencing, seeing in the pictures, um, a half torso of a demon greeting us, almost like delighted that you're home. And it was complete chaos after that. We um, tried to open the door, and it took all of us collectively to get the door open. And when we opened the door, we run to the truck. It was like a release. <laughs> My aunt goes, we need to go to a busy place. And I'm like, where? And she's like, Walmart. <laughs> and so she was a little bit more briefed on ghost experiences. And so she's like, we need to lose the spirits. We need to lose whatever is here. 
And so as per her request, we literally look like we're peeing ourselves. We run into Walmart and we kind of like lose ourselves in the crowd. You know, me and my roommate end up in the makeup section. She sends a message 20 minutes later that it's time to go. And so, you know, we meet her in the front of Walmart and, um, you know, she's got a warm smile on her face and she's got boxes and boxes of ice cream like she was a conero. Um, and so we make it to the truck and everybody gets in and an hour is going by. We're almost home and we're just went through all the boxes of ice cream and we're eating and passing and no one is saying anything. And so... Um, we get to my aunt's house and she kind of looks at me and she's like, all right, you know, it goes without telling, you know, delete them. And I'm just like, sure, <laughs> right? Um, but what she doesn't know is that I actually lied to my roommate and I lied to her about keeping them for a little while. Um, they became like a weird ritual that I would come home and check them out and like see if there was anything I can explore or notice. and. Quickly, it became really toxic, so I was like, oh, it's the pictures. I know it's a picture. So I determined one, home, uh, one night, I come home and I delete anything pre and post the whole freaking SD card. Like, I was like, I don't want nothing to do with it. And I throw it in my drawer. I worked a double. The next morning, I noticed my drawer was open. And so I like fine things, and it was vintage solid wood. So I was like, there's no way that thing is just open. And so I go to examine, and when I examine my drawer, there's a busted up remnants of what I can describe to you, my old camera. <laughs> and um, I, I don't know to this day what it was. Um, my aunt never put it up for the show Ghost Hunters. She kind of, you know, it was just kind of those things we just got to let things be, but... Um, all I can tell you is that if you allow, or if you're looking for evil, it'll find you. So, thank you. I love watching you guys' face over here. <laughs> like, oh, oh no. It's just smiling at you. I was just trying to say hi. It probably looked better in those pictures than I do in the ones I get. I hate. Yeah. That's like of our picture out did, there. Right? We're like, ah. ah. <laughs> uh, aw. Maybe that's all it was doing. It was just looking for a good photo opportunity. Also, it's weird that you went to Walmart. There's so many dead people there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it blended right in. Yeah. Uh, sorry. All right. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Our next storyteller is Caroline Davis. Caroline's going to share a story about a childhood experience that kind of lingered. Put your hands together for Caroline Davis. All right. So when I was 10, I heard a story on the playground. My friend was telling a story about how the devil would come to her house every night and scare her and her mom. It first started with footsteps going down the hallway and then it would come into their room and it would move things around and it would show itself and scare them to death. Now after I heard that story, I could not stop thinking about that story. I was 10 years old and I didn't know what else to think, you know? And so I just kept thinking about it all day, um, thinking about it in class. And then when I got home, I kept thinking about it again. And I just kept scaring myself that this would be true. I can't believe it. And so that night, I was even scared to go to sleep. It took me so long to go to sleep that night. Um, I even, you know, I got my dog and I was like, okay, I hope it doesn't happen to me. I hope it doesn't happen to me. And then I finally go to sleep. And lo and behold, 3 o'clock comes in the morning, and I'm awakened, and I hear these footsteps coming down the hall, thump, 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 all the way to my bedroom. At first, I thought it was my brother John. You know, he's working late at night. But then I'm like, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. No way. He's already home. But then I see 
I look towards my door, and the, the, there's a shadow that's coming over my room and taking over the hallway light until there's nothing but darkness in my room. And then I hear shuffling under my bed. I'm 10 years old. I have a messy room. It was dirty. Anyway, so I hear all of this shuffling, and I just blank it up and squeezing my dog and like, please go away, please go away. I'm so scared. And so that was the first night, all right? And so there are several nights that that had occurred over and over and over again, from nights where there's bleeding coming from my windows, screeching nails down my windows, everything that you could think of that has to do with being terrified about this spirit. I thought it was the devil. Um, for a long time, I thought it was the devil. Even so, my parents thought I was delusional. They did not think anything was going on. They kept saying, Caroline, there's nothing wrong with you. I'm going to prove it. I'm going to lock you in your room, and I'm going to shut the door and turn off the light. <laughs> well, that did not work. <laughs> All leading up to... This one moment in time where it was the pinnacle of this serious situation for me, um, I was about 12 at the time, and I remember this night so succinctly because it still is a part of me today. Um, I am sleeping in my bed, um, and I have my little dog. She's a chihuahua. Her name was Honey. I loved her. and. Uh, my little protector. And so I was sleeping in bed and again, woken at three o'clock in the morning. I hear the footprints, or the footsteps coming down the hallway, thump, thump, thump. And there goes again, the light coming, coming, uh, well, going away, apparently not coming. Um, and so it's just blackness in my room again. And this time it felt a little bit different um, because I had experienced it so long that I just, I was still really much in fear, but this time I had a little um, things that I was doing, like singing Christmas carols, um, like trying to get it to go away because it would just last longer and longer. And so I was singing Christmas carols. I was holding on to my dog. I had the covers over my head, uh, a pillow on my head, you know, everything to keep out the noise. And... Uh, and so I heard the stuff under the bed, but then I felt this needle come up through the bed and go into my shoulder. And I was like, okay, that's it. I can't stay in the bed. All right, so I jump up and I look, and there is this being in front of my doorway, and it has like no legs. I'm looking at um, just a torso of a guy in a biker vest, so like a leather vest like this, but with patches, and he has long hair and a beard and an upside down cross earring, and I was like, you know, 12 years old seeing a ghost, like what? Um, and so I was like, uh-uh, this is not going to happen, so I bolt it to my mom's room, and they're like, there's nothing there, here, let's go see, and you know, Later, they're never there when you, they, when you really need them to be there. And so, <laughs> so after that, it kind of uh, stopped um, being there so much. And it finally went away. It was uh, the point where I realized it wasn't the devil. It was just a spirit. And it was something that was there to haunt me or terrorize me or something like that. I don't know its real intention. I didn't ask it. I didn't care to ask it. Um, but to this day, I still have trouble sleeping. I have to sleep in the pitch black because it's better than seeing your lights go out. <laughs> right? So my husband's like, why do you like to sleep in the dark? Well, that's one of the reasons. Um, <laughs> but that's my story. Thanks for listening. You know, when she said biker, I thought like a bicycle guy. Like, oh. uh, I didn't. <laughs> I'm glad the detail, the leather jacket, uh, it helped. Definitely different. It was spooky.
It is very spooky. The first time I heard that story, I got chills just yeah. up and down. It was like, oh. Ew. Ew. Why are they always in the bedroom? They, I don't, lingering. Yeah, out. they're always in the bedroom. Like, they're go to the other house, like the other parts of the house. Although, I think we do have a couple stories about that. I know. Oh, okay. So, yeah, yeah. You're going to hear those. We're going to be great. Everything's fine. It's, it's um, fine. It's all fine. Our next storyteller is Matthew Charles. Matthew shares a story about how the only power that compels him in the morning is the snooze button. (laughs) Give it up for Matthew Charles. All right. Before I get started, uh, I want to give you guys a little bit of background information about myself. I grew up in a very conservative Christian family here in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, Back in the 90s, uh, we went to a Southern Baptist church on the south side of San Antonio. Now, this wasn't just a, a Southern Baptist church. This was a Hispanic Southern Baptist church with some very, very intense preaching. And I'm talking like the type where you slam your Bible on the pulpit and you say, and you will burn in hell, in el nombre de Jesucristo. (laughs) So very, very intense preaching. Uh, Yeah, so you kind of just give you a little bit. Uh, Well, uh, my family, we were very involved at church. I mean, we were there all the time. I'm talking, we were there for Monday night prayer, Wednesday night service, Friday night prayer service again for some reason. (laughs) Saturday morning, get up to win some souls, and then Sunday morning, good old-fashioned church. So, you know, we were there all the time. Uh, My dad was a deacon at the church. Uh, My mom's teaching Sunday school. As I got older, uh, I started, you know, getting involved. I started playing music and stuff, so I got really involved with the church band. and, And, you know, as a teenager, that's what I was doing. And I guess at the time, you know, my mindset was very much a, you know, uh, if you're going to be playing, you got to walk the walk and talk the talk. So, you know, I was about it. Uh, Anyway, so just to kind of give you guys like an idea of where I was at at 17 years old. Well, it was the first day of senior year. Um, Both of my parents, blue collar working people, they had to get up early in the morning, go to work, which left my sister and I to get ready for school in the morning on our own. at my parents' house, uh, both my sister and I, I, my room are upstairs, and our doors are like adjacent from each other, and there's a walkway in between. So it's the wee hours of the morning. I'm in my room, dead asleep. Okay, the sun hasn't even come up. Out of nowhere, my sister bursts into my room, runs up to my bed, tears practically streaming down her face. And she shakes me awake, and she's like, Matthew, something's going on my, in my room. Something's going on with my radio. And I'm just waking up, and I'm like, what are you talking about? And, and I hear, you know, uh, the volume, uh, like, going real loud. I don't know if you guys remember those early 2000 boom boxes, like, that had the volume knob that, like, rocked all the way up. And so I'm in my room barely waking up and I'm hearing the volume like rock super loud it's like and then like nothing nothing I'm like what's going on so she says like something's going on in my room the volume in my radio won't stop turning on and off and I'm trying to process this I'm trying to process this and make sure like I have a logical response I'm like just lower the volume (laughs) and she's like I already turned the volume I don't know what's going on I can't turn the volume down and and I'm like okay, just just unplug it, you know? And she's like, I already unplugged it, and now stuff's starting to fly around my room. And I'm like, what is going on? So at this point, I start to see random objects start hitting my door. I mean, I'm talking, I start seeing shoes hitting the door. I see stuffed animals flying around, and I have no idea what's going on. So at this point, I'm like, all right, I need to do something. So I jump up, and I'm like, literally on my bed, and, and coincidentally enough, I had a Bible right next to my bed. I grabbed my Bible, and I, I don't know if it was, like, the intense preaching that I was, like, brought up with, or if it was that, like, I had watched the Exorcist movie one too many times. <laughs> but it's 6.45 in the morning, and I'm ready to go. Okay, so I'm standing on my bed, and... <laughs> 
out of nowhere, I'm like, Satan, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. <laughs> well, I start to see my sister just hysterically laughing, and I'm like, what's going on? And then I see her friend walk in, and she's also laughing, and I'm like, what is going on here? Well, little did I know that uh, my sister's friend had showed up to, to our house early because they were both in band. They were going to get up and go to school early that day, go to band, whatever. Well, they had devised this entire plan. <laughs> Because little did I know, and I, I found this out later when I was talking to my sister, my parents had told her, you better make sure your brother wakes up for school tomorrow. <laughs> so she devised this entire scheme, her and her friend, to make sure that I would get out of bed because she knew that it was only gonna be the fear of the devil that was gonna get me out of bed. And that is how I started my first day of senior year. <laughs> Sisters, man. Sisters. Sisters. I oh love my it, gosh. dude. The power of Christ compels you. <laughs> I think it was more the power of sisters. I know, right? <laughs> uh, it takes a woman to get you out of bed, just saying. Um, totally, yes. Okay, settle down back there. I heard that. <laughs> Our next storyteller, we're going to get right back into it, is Natalie Duran. Natalie, hey. Fans. That's enough. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Natalie's going to share a story about how a dime a day can make a loved one hang. Please join me in welcoming Natalie Duran. In September 2020, my friend Christopher passed away in New Orleans, Louisiana. Chris was magnetic, he was hilarious, and he is one of the most dynamic humans I'd ever known. It was a tremendous loss to so many people, and I mean like so many people, like a crew of Canadian online gamers that he befriended, Cyclists, the ones who wear like the tight suits that go like the zippy suits and the shoes that go like clackety clack clack clack. Stoners, crust punks, emo kids, many best friends, his family, and his long term partner. Chris moved to Louisiana in 2019 and he immersed himself in the city. He loved the culture, he loved the food, he loved dressing to the nines and all of those like costumes, he loved the glitter. His memorial celebration was a San Antonio Mardi Gras with a brass band. Now the truest phenomenon in my life is that I always find dimes. And I had been finding dimes for years and I found them so frequently that it didn't feel like a coincidence. And I decided to look it up. I was like, does this mean something? What does this mean? So in my search, I learned that many other people had similar experiences of finding coins. And the belief is that something from the other side is trying to connect with you. Now, I'm not religious. I'm not even particularly spiritual. I was raised Catholic, uh, but I was never baptized. So all that shit is kind of complicated for me. <laughs> um, and so I still kind of was curious. And after Christopher passed, I found an abundance of dimes. They were kind of everywhere. And I, I think I wanted to believe that what I had found was, was real, but I was still skeptical. So I decided to ask a friend who is an artist and is spiritual and has a relationship with the occult. I was like, hey, <laughs> do you believe in ghosts? And she's like, fuck yeah. I fuck with ghosts. And so I tell her. I tell her about the dimes, and I tell her about what people think, think it means. And so she tells me that dimes or coins is something that like spirits kind of like fuck around with because it's an easy medium for them to use. And I was like, cool. <laughs> when Christopher passed away, I found an abundance of dimes. And I was, you know, I wanted to believe it. But then as the pandemic went on, there was like a national coin shortage and then the dime started 
to come less. You know, they were coming to me less, and then I was like, man, this, this sucks. <laughs> but then after I found a dime again, I decided that I was going to leave it in the place where I found it. Because to me, I felt like if I found it there, I'm going to leave it there. Because if it doesn't come back, I'm going to go back to it, and I'm going to remember that it was there. And it happened to me. So as they started coming back to me, they were like scattered everywhere in my apartment. Um, yeah. So some time had passed, and I bequeathed some records from Chris's personal record collection from his sister. I remember feeling really guilty about having the privilege to, to keep these records. And also, these records were like awesome. Like, my friend wanted all the best things, right? He, like, he had to have the best cycling gear. He had to have the best weed. You know, he had to have, like, king of the lobster from the Papado tank. Like, <laughs> he wanted all the best shit. So I, I decided to, like, play the record because even though I felt that guilt, I also felt like they needed to be played. So I was playing the record one day, and there's, like, this crystal vinyl... It has like this like soft center in the middle. It happened to be the record from my favorite El Paso, Texas band called At The Drive-In. Yeah, so I was like, yeah, I'm gonna play this record. So I decided to play rec the record. And then as I'm playing the record, the song Napoleon Solo starts playing. And then the lyrics start to creep in. And then they're like, the beaded impotence of New Orleans, that hint of suspense when that telephone rings. This is forever. And then he's like, from this Texas breath exhale, no sign of relief. This you'd know, this you'd know, this is forever. Dun, 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 dun. This is forever. And then he's like, and you can't take the best of us now. It's because this is forever. And something about the song just like, it like, it gets, it's so triumphant, right? And it like builds and it gets heavy. And I, I get up from my seat and I like go to the record player and I play it again. And then I play it again. And I play it again and again until I'm like, half crying, half shaking my fist, this is forever, right? <laughs> this is forever. I'm like shaking my fist and I'm like, and then there's like, also I'm like half, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> there's like this shift in the energy, right? There's like a navigator, it becomes this like, this like internal dialogue that's not mine anymore, right? And it's like also navigating me to all of the coins, the dimes I had left, scattered around my apartment. So I'm there picking up all those dimes, singing and crying. <laughs> so then I start talking out loud. And I'm like, I start to like talk about to wherever it's like directing me to go. And I'm like, all right, you want me to smoke that joint? <laughs> Hell yeah. You want, you want me to get stoned. That is so on brand, man. So. <laughs> So I get high, right? And I'm like a little freaked out. I have all these dimes in my hands. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> but then I remembered that there was a coin at back in the laundry shed. So I go back outside and I pick up the last dime. And I go outside and I start pacing. And I start pacing. And I'm having, I have all these dimes in my hand. And my friend was like called the haze perennial. He loved weed. But also he was a pacer. He would pace and he would pace and he would pace. And one time I caught him pacing and he turned to me and he was like, we're gonna transcend. We're transcending. And I was like, yeah, we're transcending. <laughs> so we transcended, right? So I, like, I'm standing out there and I'm like, uh, is this real? Like, what the fuck is happening? What's going on? What is happening, by the way? And I'm pacing and pacing and pacing. And then I remembered, like, I started asking myself, like, what can I do for you? What, what do you need from me? Is this really real? And then I remembered that I had 
been roller skating with his best friend. I had visited with his partner who was in town. I had a backyard hang with his family and we ate lobster rolls for his birthday. And then I realized my friend was asking me to take him with me. And I took him with me for as long as I, I could, as long as I felt comfortable. And I remember asking myself, like, why do I get to have this experience? What does this mean? But then I stopped asking all those questions and I just let myself feel the magic. Thank you. That's the kind of ghost I want, someone to get high with. Yeah, and not in your bedroom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he wasn't bedroom. in my room, that's tight. <laughs> oh, you want me to load a bowl? I got you. Sure, uh, yeah. And have some lobster rolls? <laughs> yeah. My best Let's friend. Let's do that. <laughs> Dude, lobster rolls again. Butter. You yes. started a movement, Patrick. Um, <laughs> damn, now I want one. Okay. Of course you do. <sighs> All right. Our next storyteller is Angie Gonzalez. Angie shares a story about the consequences of asking questions you might not want answers to. <laughs> Let's give it up for Angie Gonzalez. I'm originally from Lakewood, California. Yay. <laughs> it's one of those places that if you know, you know. I mean, to the west, we have the Queen Mary, which is haunted 365 days out of the year. To the northeast, we have DeForest Park, also haunted year round. So we're kind of this interception of residual hauntings. It's so haunted, but yet no one talks about it. You won't see any social media trace of us. Because think about it. Last time you heard someone talk about something on social media, they went missing. <laughs> My first job as a teenager was with the city of Lakewood at the Lakewood Youth Center. The Lakewood Youth Center was haunted, and the ghosts there didn't discriminate. Obviously, it was at the youth center. <laughs> so... It was so haunted to where we had to get an alarm system, a burglary alarm system that was all audio based. It would record all these findings, you know, of the glasses just breaking and women screaming. It got so bad that every time the women would scream or the glass would break, the cops would come every single time just to find the glass not shattered. There's no indication of anybody, man or woman, screaming. It was like the proof was there, but it wasn't. It got so bad, the cops got so mad because we were kept on using their resources, right? So my boss figured, I'll take it into my hands. Well, his hands, not mine. And he hired the professionals. One night he called us all in and said, hey, you guys are gonna come in. Me already scared because yes, it's haunted, but Am I gonna get paid for this? Mind you, I'm in, I'm in high school at this time still. So I'm just like, okay, yeah, everyone's coming in too. We are instructed to sit around this circular party table. As I'm sitting down, just chilling with my coworkers, I observe the professionals, the Orange County Paranormal Activity, walking throughout our facility. They had this, rod looking thing. It was kind of gimmicky really. As well as this metal box looking, it kind of looked like a silver boom box. So I saw them walking around and they finally sat down at our table. They also sat down with this black rectangle recorder and it looked so basic. So I didn't believe of anything. I was just going along with it because I had no choice. They instructed us to stay silent for 15 minutes. So we did. After the 15 minutes were up, they then instructed us to ask any question you like, because this was like an EVP, white noise type of environment. Everyone was asking their questions. When it came to me, I asked, do y'all follow us home? I don't know why I would ask that. 
At the end of our session, the second phase was to play back this white noise. When it came to my question, everyone gasped. <gasps> I don't know why, because I was just thinking about what am I going to have for lunch the next day, pizza or a cookie the size of a plate. <laughs> but <laughs> that's all that was on my mind. But they were saying that they heard that the ghost said, yes, we follow you home. But again, I was just so in my mind of what I'm going to have for lunch the next day. I go home. Everything's normal. And a few days happen. A few days go by. Everything's good. One night, though, I couldn't go to bed. And I was hungry. So I figured, I'm just going to go ahead and heat up some pizza bagels. I get up from my bed. And I know it's the same thing as usual, that as soon as I open the door, it's the hallway, the living room, and the kitchen. So I open my bedroom door, and it's dark in the hallway, as expected. I'm walking through the hallway, and there's a creek. But that's normal. It's an old house. What isn't normal, though, is I don't hear my dad snoring. And that man can snore. He wakes up the whole neighborhood. And I don't hear my mom's reruns of Law and Order on. And she has to have the TV on to drown out my dad's snoring. But I don't think of anything of it. I just know I'm hungry and I have one thing to do. So I continue to walk and I open the free I get to the kitchen and I open the freezer. And I put the pizza bagels on my favorite glass dish. Pop them in the microwave. And I watch the green countdown on the microwave go down from five, four, three, two. And I grab the handle because I know I cannot afford my dad to yell at me if this alarm goes off. <laughs> so I pull the pizza bagels out, mission complete. I grab the glass dish. I turn back to go back to my room. And it drops. I look up and I scream, close your ears because it sounds just like this, just like, <gasps> nothing, nothing comes out. I'm staring at this figure. I'm staring at this figure and it has a knife. And I, I swear to you, I know that this is going to be my last breath. It probably was my last breath, I felt. The world knows that I can't swim, including you guys now. So it was just like as if I was drowning. And I can't swim in the pool, and I obviously can't swim on land now. It was the pressure that was in the front of me, in the back of me, on top of me, behind. It, it was just a pressure that I cannot scream. I was in shock. I immediately looked down, and <laughs> the glass wasn't shattered. But I swear I heard it shatter just like at the youth center. The glass was just fine. So I grab a knife anyways. I go through all of the drawers just to get a knife. I don't know what a kitchen knife can do. But that's better than my fists in this situation. I grab a knife and I look back into the hallway and nothing's there. I run to my room and Nothing is there. Mom, Dad, I run into their room with a knife and I open the door just so slowly. I see my dad's mouth. It's open just like this. <laughs> but he's snoring. That sweet sound of snoring knowing that he's safe. My mom, she's still watching TV, asleep of course, but I do hear the dun dun for a special victims unit, but I'm not the victim. <laughs> so that's reassuring. After that night, I haven't spoken about it. Little things have happened. And even recently, I wanted to question my own sanity. As soon as recent as last week, I reached out to one of my coworkers that was there that night. And I was hoping that he would say that, no, I'm crazy. But not only does he remember, it was on Facebook Messenger that he told me that he still thinks about it to this day. And it's weird because he's also from Lakewood and he moved out to Texas. The reassuring thing is that he is now a minister, 
So the moral of the story is, if you ever get haunted, make sure that you become friends with a minister. <laughs> Thank you. Ew. No, I don't like that guy. I don't like it. Mm, no. Those poor pizza bagels. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds tasty. All right. Oh, man, it's the end. Are you guys sad? Mm. All right, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, we get the last one. <laughs> what do you mean? That's one more. We got one more. Uh, I'm so sad. I am sad, but this has been great. Give it up for everybody. It's so great. I forgot to mention earlier we were selling sage at the concession stand. Uh, because we even, I got smudged. Did anybody get smudged before they came in? Yep. That was Good lovely. Idea. I was just like, do it all. <laughs> and then I'm like, now my bank account. Um, <laughs> didn't work. All right. Our final storyteller of the night is Becky Garcia. Becky is going to share a story about death and renting in L.A. Please welcome our final storyteller, Becky Garcia. Hello. So about seven years ago, I was living in Los Angeles in this really old apartment from the 20s. It was a really cold apartment because I was on the top floor in the center right by the old elevator shaft that it had worked in like maybe 50 years. It was just me and my tiny little eight pound rat terrier dog. For years, it was just the two of us. And, uh, you know, even though it was kind of a creepy place, I always felt pretty safe overall, you know, didn't really worry about much, except for one day when I did. I got home one day from work, and I found all of my dog's toys just scattered all over the apartment, as well as all of my clothes uh, that were in the hamper. All of that was also spread out throughout my apartment. And I dismissed it because I thought, maybe it's an earthquake, and I just didn't feel it. I mean, I've been there for a while. Like, it's pretty common. Uh, then it happened a few days after that. And I thought, well, maybe the apartment is shifting. This is an old place. It could be that. And then it happens again and again and again. And I think maybe my dog's just pissed at me. You know, Maybe he's going through like a rebellious phase because I'm not home all the time. But then I think maybe I just have a ghost. And if they can keep you know, their space and I can have my space and we just don't you know, bump heads, I think we'll be OK. So I live with this ghost, or at least I'm going to say it's a ghost, because other things start happening on top of that. Like, a couple of times I was in my bed and I felt the weight of someone else in the bed with me. I'd feel like a hand resting on my hip or on my shoulder. <laughs> Another time too, I felt uh, like an entire body just roll over next to me. And it wasn't my dog because he's on the other side of the room. So it wasn't that guy. So I'd feel things like that. It's just super, super creepy all the time. And then I even heard my name called a few times. Like It wasn't like someone shouted my name or whispered my name. It was, it was a real casual way to say my name. Just Becky, Becky. I'd hear that every now and then. And I just, yeah, I just accepted, OK, it's a ghost. You know, It's like, it's somebody who lives here. So that's why it's casual. It just seems normal. But also, it's like, you know what? I could deal with the roommate ghost. You know, if they did nice things, that'd be, that'd be, that'd be OK. Like if I came home and like the laundry was done or the dishes were done. <laughs> I'd be like, absolutely, stay as long as you like, you know, haunt me all night, I don't care. But these things do happen for a while, and then uh, coincidentally, I had to go on a trip. So I go away for a while, and I think, well, let's see if this thing follows me. And I go on a trip, I'm away for 10 days, and everything's peaceful, everything's cool, everything's normal. I get back home, I put my bags down, get my dog settled in. I look around my apartment, everything seems normal, except, oh, what's this? I had a crucifix mounted at the top of my door for years. When I got home from that trip, that crucifix was upright on my bedside table. That is creepy, but at least it wasn't upside down. You know, it could have been a lot scarier. <laughs> so this happens, and I call the building supervisor. He's like a 22-year-old stoner. I'm like, hey, man, like I think something's up in my apartment. He's like, what's going on? I was like, well, first off, like, hopefully you guys just like, did you come in my apartment and like do anything for maintenance? He's like, no, nah, girl, we haven't touched it. I was like, OK. What's going on? I was like, well, I think I got a ghost. He's like, oh, word. Yeah, you probably do. Uh, <laughs> he's like, oh, uh, yeah, well, you know, like three people died in the uh, like apartment, right? Like maybe like in the last couple of months, like three different people died this past summer. I'm like, I didn't know that. Click, scream. But, you know, uh, I, I just, I, I couldn't move. And, you know, I just, I'm stuck in that place. I don't make a lot of money. Like, 
I just like people are like, why don't she? Why doesn't she just go? Like, like that's the, the moment. If this was a movie, you're like, just leave. Like, there's a ghost and you're being haunted. But you guys don't know how expensive it is to find an apartment in Los Angeles under eleven hundred dollars. So I had to stay there. Like, I'd literally rather die than have to lose my security deposit. <laughs> so I'm forced to stay there. So yeah, that happens. And I'm like, I mean, I mean, I'm stuck here. I'm sorry, little dude. We're stuck here. And then one day, I'm watching TV. It's just me and my dog, as usual, watching TV. And then out of nowhere, my dog yelps in a way he's never done before or since. It was so scary. He just like threw himself on the ground and writhed around in pain for a few seconds. I picked him up. I inspected him. And I don't know what went wrong because like he looked fine. It doesn't, doesn't look like anything happened to him. And he just got over it. But I wasn't over it because at this point, I said, you know what? If there's a ghost and you mess with me, that sucks for me. You mess with my dog. This is gonna suck for you. I'm like, by the <laughs> oh yeah, thank you, dog. Uh, yeah, we all love our doggies so much. So I was like, you know what? You know, uh, by the time I'm done with you, you're gonna wish you were dead. Er. <laughs> so, so uh, I just start like googling every single like ritual like that's out there for ghost busting. I do all that stuff. I even go to church. My mom loves it. I actually went to church for this. And I like grabbed the pastor by the stole and I was like, you gotta help me. There's a demon in my home. I mean, that's how I played out in my head, but it wasn't that dramatic. It was like sheepishly like, excuse me, can you please bless my dog? <laughs> and he did. He's like, of course, my child, or whatever, whatever this is. Uh, <laughs> and I just turned on my dog like, surprise, bitch. You're both we're both Catholic now. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, we both have to deal with guilt. It's wonderful. <laughs> So I, I do all the things. I smudge, I pray. I do this thing that this Haitian buddy told me of mine where like you sweep from like the walls into one big pile and then you just like brush it all out, like uh, sweep it all out of your uh, door and just like that's whenever you cast the spirit out. You're like, you tell them you gotta get out of here, go away. And I'm like, are you also just trying to get me to clean my dirty ass apartment? <laughs> it's very specific, these rules. But uh, I do it, like I do all these things. And I'm like, you can't touch me and my son ever again. Get out of my apartment, be gone. And I guess it works because like, I don't hear anything for weeks and then weeks become months. And I'm like, everything's peaceful, everything's great. I love it, it's cool, it's normal again. Or uh, I don't know, maybe it wasn't because um, I go out to meet a friend of mine who's a cop. Um, he actually was a Tinder date initially when I first met him and then I was like, oh, you're a cop, never mind. Because <laughs> uh, the one thing I don't like you know, more than ghosts is law enforcement, so. I mean, you can't keep handcuffs in your house for like not fun reasons. That's, I just don't feel safe. So uh, I'm out with my cop buddy friend and I tell him the whole thing and he's like, wow, that's wild, Becky, man. I'm so sorry that this is happening to you. Um, but I kind of wish it was just a ghost that was haunting you and not this thing I'm about to tell you. I lean in and I'm like, what? He goes, it sounds weird, but like, are you missing any panties? I'm like, dude, you're so obsessed with me. Stop asking me. It's not going to happen. Um, he's like, no, no, seriously. Like, uh, I want you to like look through your panties, like your panty drawer, and see if any are missing. I'm like, first off, I wear Hanes her way, like big ass briefs and like, like, a, like an economy pack. I'm like, I don't keep track of all those. It's difficult. So uh, he's like, okay, yeah. So go look through your panties when you can. But also, like, do you have any enemies, anybody with a key? I'm like, I don't know. He's like, okay, well, I don't want to scare you, but I think I'm about to. So there was a guy a while back that they arrested who was staking out the lives of women that lived alone. And when they weren't home, he would sneak in and he would manipulate things. He'd move things around so that whenever you came to or whenever you got home, you would think that either you were losing your mind or that you're being haunted. And as a little token, a little treat to himself, he would take a pair of your panties. So he's like, yeah, they're called panty bandits. So I don't want to say that it's exactly this guy, like specifically him, but it could be somebody like that. So I'll ask again, do you have any enemies or crazy ex-boyfriends, anybody with a key? I'm like, I do have crazy exes, absolutely. Uh, and enemies, yeah, a couple of those. But as far as like someone with a key, no, I don't know anybody with a key. He's like, are you sure? I was like, I mean, well, there's that building manager, but no, oh, he's not a creep. And he says, Becky, I'm a cop, and I'm going to tell you every man is a creep. So 
in summation, I don't know if it was a ghost. I don't know if it was a pervert. I don't know if my dog was just freaking out or it's some like combination of all those things. But the one thing that's for certain is that being a woman is living its own never-ending nightmare. Thank you.